Hello, this is Henry Covert. I'm a She Never Slept, and I'm back with my Retro Drum column where I discuss uh, obscure and forgotten treasures of uh, books and film and comics, etc. And uh, the last time around, which has been a while, far too long, I discussed um, some Fu Manchu reissues by Sax Romer, published by Titan Books. And now I'll be talking about two more reissues by Titan Books of two exciting uh, novels that have been out of print for a long time and uh, widely sought after. Um, these are the first two in a, what we call the Walt Newton series and a lot of people ask me what is Walt Newton and there's confusion among fandom as to what is Walt Newton exactly. Well, Walt Newton in real life terms uh, is a cottage in England in Yorkshire and in 1795 a meteorite hit, struck this cottage and in the world of fiction uh, or metafiction uh, it's a place where the meteorite irradiated uh, several coaches worth of passerbys, mostly of English royalty, and their descendants intermarried and were mutants of some sort or another and became some of the 20th century's most well-known uh, science fiction and fantasy and adventure characters, heroes, detectives, explorers, sarge supervillains, and um, it's very interesting. A lot of characters fall under this rubric, such as Tarzan, James Bond, Fu Manchu, Doc Savage, The Shadow, uh, and countless others. Um, Philip Jose Farmer was the writer who first came up with the conceit of Walt Newton as the place of the meteor strike, which led to the meteor mutants, which he calls the Walt Newton family. And the Walt Newton family is uh, an area which he wrote, wrote several uh, novels and short stories about, and two. Uh, fictional biographies, one called Tarzan Alive and one called Doc Savage's Apocalyptic Life. And the Tarzan Alive one was so successful that it began being classified in the biography section of most libraries. Uh, he actually, uh, his readers truly believed that Lord Greystoke did indeed live and that the novels by Edgar Rice Burroughs were simply exaggerated uh, and slightly fictionalized versions of his life story. Um, Tarzan Alive led to the Doc Savage book, which uh, Farmer introduced more fantasy elements and didn't quite uh, try to make it as uh, realistic. He didn't go into the, as many details to make it seem as though it was truly a biography. Um, he examined Doc Savage's Super Sagas, which are the, the series of pulp adventures that came out in the 30s and 40s. And um, then he expanded what he called the Walt Newton family. Tarzan and Doc Savage are cousins. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is a relative of theirs. You have characters such as James Bond, Fu Manchu, The Shadow, uh, Lord Peter Whimsey. There are countless others. And um, he continues to expand the family throughout these two books and even um, revises some of his own previous theories. This was an outgrowth of something that he was a part of called The Game. And The Game is like a literary ga game, literally, where um, someone uh, presupposes uh, well, basically, they take a fictional document and try to uh, reconcile its continuity. Uh, they began with the Sherlock Holmes stories and the stories that are by Arthur Conan Doyle that are known as his canon. And then, of course, since he's passed away, Sherlock Holmes has fallen into the public domain, and there have been countless uh, an offshoots called pastiche. And pastiche fiction essentially is a takeoff or a riff on the original um, by someone other than the originating author. And um, there have been more. Sherlock Holmes pastiche novels than any character in literary history by far. Dracula is a very distant second. The Cthulhu Mythos is a very distant third. Um, these are ones that have constantly been revisited by writers who played in the sandboxes of these respective authors. Uh, and so Farmer was a member of uh, one of the Sherlock Holmes societies and um, they basically found all these errors in Holmes's work, I'm sorry, in Arthur Conan Doyle's work which they attribute to Dr. James Watson and Doyle is simply the editor. So here you get the idea of this is a real man, this really happened, and you also get the idea of how do we reconcile these continuity lapses. Well, you know, this is before the uh, horrid state we're in today where everything is simply rebooted away every few months to make a quick buck. This is actually a time when people cared uh, about the characters and wanted some consistency and wanted to continue the saga and see how things progressed. So they did this with Sherlock Holmes. And um, a lot of the societies and Holmesian groups would meet and they would discuss these kind of things and um, analyze them. Foremost among these was William S. Baringold, who wrote a book called Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, which was the first real fictional biography of note. And 
he contends that Sherlock Holmes was a real man and that his adventures were based in reality and that Arthur Conan Doyle, the editor, simply embellished uh, what Watson gave him. And uh, so Farmer was a huge fan of Tarzan and uh, he saw some connections through the work of several of the uh, Holmesians that could be connected with some of Edgar Rice Burroughs' work. And so he began conflating characters from these different um, authors, uh, such as Edgar Rice Burroughs, George Bernard Shaw, Doyle, etc. And he came up with his hypotheses for Tarzan Alive. And, um, and then he expanded it further with Doc Savage. Uh, basically, um, one of the pivotal documents uh, of farmers, and which is important to what we're going to talk about today, is uh, a, submersi a submersible subterfuge by Professor H.W. Starr, who is kind of a mysterious figure, but he was a prominent Holmesian, and he wrote an essay in which he contended that Professor James Moriarty, the arch foe of Sherlock Holmes, was in fact Captain Nemo, the man J uh, Jules Verne writes about in The Mysterious Island and uh, um, the other one. Yes, the other one, my brain has gone blank. But uh, anyway, Mysterious Island, he, he contends that Nemo is Dakar, an Indian prince and a freedom fighter. Um, whereas originally, uh, you know, Nemo is kind of a villainous character aboard his nuclear submarine, the Nautilus. And uh, the two are very hard to reconcile. Some writers such as Winscott Eckert, more about him later, have managed to reconcile the two accounts. Some have taken the Mysterious Island as to be the book chapter verse uh, version of Nemo the Indian uh, revolutionary that's portrayed in Alan Moore's uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and it's one of the only things in the uh, loathsome film adaptation that they did get right that he was indeed an Indian and um, anyway uh, so Farmer, I mean uh, Star kind of goes in a different direction and says that Moriarty actually was Nemo and he kind of throws a few hints as to how this could be possible etc and this largely dismisses Mysterious Island um, as being kind of a fictional account. So, um, anyway, we come to this essay, which had a huge influence on Farmer. And Farmer wrote several of his own and his answers back, and um, some of this ended up in Tarzan Alive. And uh, the next place it ended up was in his first full-fledged Walt Newton novel. And that's what we're talking about today, The Other Log of Phileas Fogg. Phileas Fogg is the major character, or the main character of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. And Phileas Fogg in the book is a very, um, he lives his life almost with metronomic certitude. He, everything is timed down to the microsecond. He's an incredibly fastidious man. And he uh, takes this uh, wager to cross around the world in 80 days. And the popular conception is that, you know, through films and things, that he took a hot air balloon. But actually, he traveled by land and by sea. And he got around the world, and he barely made his wager. Um, Farmer looks at this as being kind of dubious. Uh, why did he accept this wager? Why would a man who lived the life that Fogg lived uh, go on this tangent? Uh, what did he gain from it? And... Uh, what are the inaccuracies that crept into Verne's account? So again, he's looking at it as what happened in real life, or if this happened in real life, what would really be the story behind the story, i.e. metafiction. And The Other Log of Phileas Fogg is a penultimate metafictional novel of Farmer's. It's truly uh, one where he analyzes from a certain vantage point and remove every element of Verne's novel and introduces a parallel log to the one in uh, Verne's novel. And in this one, what is at stake is an alien teleportation device known as a distorter. And the distorter needs not get into the hands of an evil alien race called the Eridanians. Uh, a more benevolent alien race, the Capellians, uh, they intend to stop this happening. And so they have agents who they uh, bring into the fold and give immortality, or rather a thousand years of extended life to. And one of these is Phileas Fogg. And so Phileas Fogg's race around the world is to prevent this teleporter from getting in the hands of the Eridanians. And he and his partner and sidekick, Passporto, they uh, do everything they can to combat these evil forces. The Eridanians agent on Earth is Professor James Moriarty, a.k.a. Captain Nemo. For a long time in the novel, he's known only as Nemo, and eventually you get the reveal. I'm not saying too much about this, spoiler-wise, because in all of the promotional material relating to this book, 
the revelation's there, and it's out there. And, of course, anyone who's buying a Walt Newton book probably already knows that Farmer thinks Nemo and Moriarty are the same person. Um, I won't go any further, spoiler-wise, as far as what how the novel ends or how it resolves itself. But suffice to say, um, it's very interesting. It's very action-packed. Um, it's very precise. Uh, Farmer analyzes uh, Verne's prose uh, to a T, and... Um, Maybe I shouldn't say this, but in my opinion, he outdoes the master in this area. And uh, the great selling points of this novel, for those who've already read it before, are uh, some essays in the back. One is called Only a Coincidence by Winscott Eckert. And in this one, he explores Phileas Fogg and his family tree, which, of course, is part of the Walt Newton family tree that I mentioned earlier. But he uh, focuses on a section of it which ties in with one of Farmer's uh, novel series called The World of Tears, starring a character called Paul Janus, Paul Janus Finnegan, a.k.a. Kikaha the Trickster. And this is a science fiction novel in which there are pocket universes, and Kikaha passes through them to battle the uh, evil of Red Orc. And the thing about it is he sees that there are parallels uh, family-wise between Fogg and um, Finnegan. He ties them together with some other fictional characters. I'll let that be a surprise. And he also ties them in with Farmer himself, and that's probably the largest revelation and the most clever uh, thing that uh, Eckert has managed to do is to take some hints and little end jokes that Farmer sprinkled through the books about himself. For instance, is there any coincidence that Phileas Fogg's initials and mine are the same. You can interpret that many ways. Some people think he's, are, are they the same person? Well, no, but you're on the right track. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting mystery, and Eckert unlocks the mystery. And it's very satisfying, and it's very interesting. And he did a lot of real-world research as well as detailed analysis of uh, Verne and of uh, Farmer's World of Tears series. And finally, there's a chronology in the back of the book which details the entire around the world in 80 day trip uh... from the perspective of uh... from a farmerian perspective and uh... puts into perspective what happens when and etc so these two uh... end paper uh... pieces are really crucial to enjoying the book for those who've already read it i myself ashamed to admit had not read it before this time i would read most of the farmer Walt newton materials but the other log of Phileas Fogg, I read a few chapters of when I was 14 years old, and that's been a lot longer ago than I would like to admit. So I really did not remember the details, and now that I've read it, I'm happy I've read it, and I'll be glad to reread it again and again. Uh, the next novel I want to talk about is called Time's Last Gift, and this is billed as a Walt Newton prehistory novel, and Time's Last Gift is a Walt Newton novel in a different sense. It does tie in with the Walt Newton family, but it's like the prehistoric Walt Newton family. Now, how far back does he go? How does their prehistoric Walt Newton family? Well, he ties several things together in this, not so much in this book, but he lays a lot of hints and pieces and groundwork, which other writers such as Eckert and uh, Christopher Paul Carey, especially, have recently tied together, and it creates a really beautiful mosaic. Um, Time's Last Gift is a, uh, set in the year 2070 A.D., and as they used to call it, and um, he, they go back to 12,000 B.C. in a time machine called the uh, the H.G. Uh, Wells. Um, the party is led by a man called John Gribbertson for Project Kronos, and he and a scientist and his wife Rachel and another uh, anthropologist go back in time uh, ostensibly to study this alien culture, I'm sorry, this prehistoric culture called the Magdalenians, uh, another little hint there with the name, and um, John Gribbertson is a mystery to the rest of the crew. Uh, he has an enormous knowledge of most sciences, he's very charismatic, he's very mysterious, he's very strong, he uh, immediately takes to the prehistoric, the Stone Age tribes, he studies them, he befriends them, and he seems strangely at home with their ways. He seems very free and very commanding of this kind of scenario, being in the wild, being in the jungle. Well, these are clues. Uh, Farmer never says this outright, and I won't say it outright either for a variety of reasons, but uh, I'll be like Farmer and simply say that 
If you pay attention to Time's Last Gift, think of the title Time's Last Gift, TLG, and think about why is this man coming from the future and going into the past, and why is he so at home in the jungle? John Gribbertson, who is this John? And why, why does he suddenly, uh, toward the end of the new epilogue, uh, mention that he'd had a wife named Jane? Well, I probably said too much, but uh, you have to read it for yourself to figure out is this really what he's implying, and uh, or are us Walt Newton aficionados merely reading too much into it? Well, Farmer is definitely intentionally uh, making it. He's giving us all the clues we need to just go ahead and be out with it. But I'm not going to spoil it. If you haven't figured it out yet, just read the novel. You will figure it out. And if you don't, you'll still love the novel because Farmer is very detailed and a uh, storyteller. He's got the anthropological aspects of the setting down pat. He's got the mechanics of time travel down pat, and he does it in an interesting way. He doesn't introduce any uh, predictable paradoxes that have come many times before. There is a time paradox uh, that's crucial toward the end, but that is also the final clue you'll need to unlock this mystery of who is John Gribbertson and what is time's last gift. Um, in this volume, there are also some interesting endnote papers. Uh, Christopher Paul Carey, another uh, Walt Newton scholar alongside William, I'm sorry, Winscott Eckert, uh, both of whom are uh, I'm proud to number as friends and colleagues of mine in the past and present. Uh, Christopher Paul Carey writes Gribbertson and the Prehistoric Walt Newton Family. So he discusses how does this fit into the Walt Newton family? What is this, what's the place in the mythos? And it ties closely in with a, a series of novels Farmer wrote in the early 70s, the Opar novels. He wrote two. And um, Hadon, of Hadon of Ancient Opar, the first one, will be uh, reprinted soon by Titan Books. Um, and these basically took off on Tarzan's lost city of Opar, where he uh, meets La, the mysterious priestess, and uh, has adventures in this exotic land that's been lost for, in time. And he examines Opar from a prehistoric perspective. What was it like in ancient times? And it's kind of a... Uh, fantasy milieu similar to the Hyborian Age of uh, Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian and Hadon is a Conan-esque kind of character and adventurer and um, he wrote two of these novels uh, which comprise this and uh, Hadon of Ancient Opar which I mentioned in Flight to Opar and he left fragments for a third one uh, called A Song of Kwasin. These three together have been compiled uh, by Christopher Paul Carey, who has completed the Song of Kwasin with Farmer posthumously uh, in this Gods of Opar. Now, this is a book I'm not formally reviewing today simply because I have not read all of it and I would not like to just, you know, review something I haven't actually completed. And it's quite a massive tome. Uh, I have never read the Opar novels before. Um, I'm rather familiar with them, and I'm familiar with uh, some of the figures in the novels, and there's a figure in the novel that's very prominent called Sahindar, and once you get into the Sahindar legend and who this character is, you'll see the connection with Time's Last Gift. And what isn't made clear in Time's Last Gift and in the end by Winscott Eckert is made very clear by Christopher Paul Carey in Gods of Opar, and uh, this was, it was published by Subterranean Press. Uh, but the first edition, the first uh, one in the series, like I mentioned, will also be uh, reprinted as a standalone uh, Walt Newton novel, um, Hadon of Ancient Opar, by uh, Titan in January, I believe. Um, we have some more Walt Newton ones coming up. There's a Parallel Universe trilogy, and the first of these is called A Feast Unknown, and it's one that I hope to either cover here or possibly write an entire article on because I have read it numerous times and uh, it's probably Farmer's most daring, uh, explicit, groundbreaking, just kind of mind-blowing novel. Uh, it's not for the squeamish and uh, it's definitely for the adventurous minded and open-minded readers. It's very controversial for its uh, violent graphic and sexual content but I would not let that turn you aside if you are someone who craves adult, good adult science fiction fantasy. A Feast Unknown uh, has just been released, and I would uh, advise anyone to pick it up. But again, I'll uh, give you a more formal review of that either in the next installment or so of Retrodrome, or I'll write an uh, article for She Never Slept. 
And uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'm not sure what I'll be covering next time. I'm going to get back into some more movies. Uh, Possession by Andrzej Zalowski Jowal- uh, is a favorite that I'll be reviewing soon uh, with Sam Neill and Isabella Johnny. And uh, anyone who saw my Antichrist review uh, will note the similarities between the two movies. And I'm looking forward to talking about that film. I watched it again recently, and it's just as incredible as the other times I've reviewed it. So that's it for today. I just wanted to share the Walt Newton series. Titan Books is doing an incredible job. We're going to be on site reviewing other Titan Books releases. Uh, one of our uh, minions, Scott, uh, Sean Levin, is uh, reviewing a number of uh, Titan Books releases as well. So that's it for today, and uh, I appreciate you t- tuning in. And this has been Retrodrome, and I'm Henry Covert. She never slept.